Thank you. 
draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord.
fifth Sunday after Pentecost is from Jeremiah chapter 28. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to Hananiah the prophet in the presence of all the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord make the words that you have prophesied come true and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. And hear now this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies peace, when the word of that prophet comes to pass, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. The epistle is from Romans, chapter 7. Do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives? Thus, a married woman is bound by the law to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ, so that you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. Now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, that we serve not under the old written code, but in the new life of the Spirit. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. I would not have known what it is to covet, if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity for the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law. When the commandment came, the sin came alive, and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Did, did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin, producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment it might become sinful beyond measure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We stand to the other way.
This is the gospel of the Lord.
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon this morning follows directly on the heels of what we heard from St. Paul's epistle to the Romans last week. There we were reminded that as Christians we have freedom, true freedom found only in Christ. Sin has no dominion over us as we have died with, died with Christ and been raised to new life under grace. We are no longer slaves to sin, servants of Christ who look to Jesus for our salvation and strength, rather than to our own efforts to free and save ourselves. So St. Paul continues this morning with an illustration to emphasize his point. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by the law to her husband while he lives. If her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law. And if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. So our modern society has pretty much made a mockery of the institution of marriage. Paul's illustration here is still understandable, even in a culture with so-called no-fault divorce. God intended from the beginning that marriage was to be between one man and one woman for life. It is becoming together of two individuals to form a joint union, which, because God was the one joining it together, no man could or should break. While biblical exceptions for adultery, abuse, and abandonment can be found, exceptions do not overturn the basic principle put forward. And so marriage rights for centuries have picked up on this by including language in the vows of till death do us part, or all the days of my life, or something similar. Yet continued therein in the acknowledge, is the acknowledgement that at some point the marriage will in fact end, only in death. The bonds of marriage are unbreakable as long as both parties are living. But there will be no need for marriage in the new creation. Now all analogies and illustrations can be pressed too far, so we will be sure to not do so here. But Paul is using this illustration to illustrate our relationship to the law. The law is binding on us only as long as we are alive. In death, the bonds that bind us to the law are severed, just as they are when husband or wife precedes a spouse in death. So Paul goes on to say, Likewise, my brothers, you also have died with the law to the body of Christ, and you may belong to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. This is the great freeing revelation for the Christian. Paul returns to, the, to his point from near the beginning of chapter 6. For those who have been baptized, you have already died, because you've been baptized into the death of Jesus. You have died drowned in a watery pool as the holy waters of baptism crash over your head. And just as Jesus has been raised from the dead, so you too were raised from that watery tomb to live in Christ, bearing fruit for God. Now we come to perhaps one of the most perplexing parts of all of St. Paul's writings. He says, For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. Now we are released from the law, from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet. The law had not said, You shall not covet. But sin is seizing an opportunity through the commandment produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law. When the commandment came, sin came alive, and I died. 
very commandment that promised life proved to be death to him. For sin, seizing an opportunity for this commandment, deceived him, and through it killed him. Well, two things tend to be particularly confusing here. First, Paul in this section and in the remainder of the chapter, which we will hear next week, is rather ambiguous as to whether he's writing about a Christian or a non-Christian. This section is particularly confusing to many modern, modern Christians because it seems like Paul is borderline bipolar, speaking of his pre-conversion and his post-conversion self in rapid succession and flipping back and forth. But then, perhaps most confusingly, he appears to identify the law as being the cause of sin. He says our sinful passions aroused by the law were working to bear fruit for death. And if it had not been for the law, I would not have known the sin. So what is Paul talking about? Well, once again, we see laid bare what I've spoken about a number of times. This tension that exists in the life of a Christian. We are redeemed children of God, and yet we continue to struggle and sometimes even relish in our sin. Part of the biggest problem that we have is that we must acknowledge that our own flesh is working against us. We don't even really need Satan's help in order to fall into temptations. Our flesh is weak, thoroughly corrupted by sin. And the great irony is that what Paul says here concerning the law is true. It has a dangerous effect upon our sinful flesh to be taught about the law. It is, of course, always important to teach Christians about the Ten Commandments, to have the revealing light of God's law shine into our hearts, to both reveal the wretchedness within and reveal the path for our redeemed lives. But perhaps somewhat cruelly, the law in teaching us what not to do provides our sinful flesh with a blueprint to even greater sin. Paul notes that because of the law, we now know how to covet. That's because it says, you shall not covet. As every parent can attest, the act of telling your child not to do so, to do something, just intensifies the desire to do the forbidden act. We, like our parents in the Garden of Eden, desire the forbidden fruit because it has been withheld from us. If the law is not sin, and it is not the power behind our sinful desires and actions, it is the corrupt heart that we've inherited that drives such things, and corrupt even the goodness of God's law. If God's law is holy, perfect, righteous, and good, because God himself is holy, perfect, righteous, and good. His law does not bring death to us. It only reveals the reality of our place in the grave already. And that is why the text of the hymn that we just sang is so important. We trudge through five stanzas that just show how hope that, that just show the hopelessness that comes from the law apart from Christ. God's law is holy. It shows us a path to life that none of us and follow that path to life eternal. We are dead in our trespasses and sins, unable to take even a single step toward our Lord and His righteousness. The light of God's holiness burns away at the rotten edges of our heart, seared and singed. The law is good. Since the fall, its holiness condemns us all. It dooms us for our sin to die has no power to justify. To Jesus we for refuge flee, who from the curse has set us free. We humbly worship at his throne, saved by his grace, through faith alone. Well, the law of God is good and wise. There is no life for us to be found in the law. Instead, it is, as the next page in the hymnal states, the gospel shows the Father's grace, who sent his Son to save our race, proclaims how Jesus lived and died, that we might thus be justified. 
sets the lamb before our eyes who made the atoning sacrifice and calls the souls with guilt oppressed to come and find eternal rest. It brings the Savior's righteousness to robe our souls in royal dress. And all our guilt it brings release and gives the troubled conscience peace. May we in faith its message learn, not thanklessly its blessings spurn. May we in faith its truth confess and praise the Lord, our righteousness. Amen. Now may the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. We stand as we sing the offer. especially those who cannot find agreement within their own families on the word of God, from which life itself comes. Assure them that their stand for your truth is necessary, and guard them from seeking a false or easier peace. Turn us in every earthly disappointment for the promise of your eternal and undivided church triumph. Lord, in your mercy. Father in heaven. Bring earthly peace, not a sword, to our homes by your grace. Foster a common love and knowledge of your word among husbands and wives, parents and children, and guide their love for one another by your love for them. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Almighty God, watch over all who make, judge, and administer the laws of our nation, and preserve us from sinful contempt of good order and godly law. Give to our authorities integrity and honor, and bless all inhabitants with charity and love. Lord, in your mercy. Yes. Gracious Father, according to your promise, you returned exiles from captivity to Jerusalem. 
Remember those who are displaced from their homes by violence, war, or persecution. Provide them with shelter and bodily needs, and foster in them the hope of an eternal home in Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of heaven and earth, strengthen your people to hold fast to your word in times of trouble, especially Pat, Kevin, Teresa, Carla, Bob, Wayne, Nancy, Kimberly, Jody, Dawn, Shirley, Arlene, Dawn, Rosemary, Cheryl, Mike, Roberta, and all those we name in our hearts. Preserve them from false messages of peace that do not remove sin. Sustain their faith in Christ, in his peace, and in his life. Strengthen and heal their bodies and souls according to your great mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Heavenly Father, we have died to belong to the body of Christ, and now belong to him who was raised from the dead. Prepare all who commune this day with penitent hearts and a true confession of faith. Receive Christ's body and blood for the forgiveness of their sins. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Lord God, Heavenly Father, bless us in Christ, that we may bear much fruit. Receive our inadequate thanks for your kindness, especially toward all who have died in the faith and now rest from their labors. Preserve us in the way of the Holy Spirit until we stand with them in glory. You live and reign with the same Son and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And when he 
had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
thanks to Almighty God that you've refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us with the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever.
up shoes, you wouldn't have any back that you have to pay. The tax was on it. So, yeah, at least it keeps you good. Yeah. We'll try and get to you are, uh, you your office this week <laughs> to sign the papers. So, uh, okay. before? I, I got myself uh, one of those things. I wanted to do this. I guess a lot of us are tired. Also, should you stop indoors and watch a movie? Yes. Watch the movie. Yeah. Uh, do a jigsaw yeah. puzzle. Yeah. 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 Yeah.